And the floor is yours, Daniel. All right. Cheers. Okay, how much how much time do we have? Um, we have uh, forty five minutes. So we we started late because of the check in. So you should you should feel free to take that time. So we can end at seven thirty. All right, no problem. Leave time for questions. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to introduce myself a little bit more. Um, so I work with the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives as a technical assistance uh, program manager. Um, I've worked with co-ops and nonprofits of all kinds for the past 11 years now. Um, I've worked with mobile home park cooperatives, do tech co-ops, uh, food processing, um, agriculture, um, you name it. Uh, my background is actually in studying primates, primates behavior in ecology. But when I was going to grad school, I was always was really interested in agriculture and, and farming. And so I was starting up a a virtual food cooperative in this small rural town in Washington. Um, I knew nothing about bylaws or business plans. I had a lot of connections, had a good idea what it was like to start up a grocery store, um, but there was all this other work involved in starting up a business and add on like a cooperative governance to that. Um, so I got help with a, a technical assistance provider in, in the North Pacific Northwest. And that kind of started me on the journey and I learned a lot more about co-ops. I realized for me, it's, it, it grew from something about, you know, my local food efforts to like, um, to me, I was really about social justice. Um, moved to West Africa for about two years, was working with, I kept doing the primate stuff and then moved back during the Ebola outbreak from Liberia. And I ended up working with a technical assistance provider that helped me start up that co-op. And I've been working with them for about five or six years now and with the US Federation uh, for about three years. And so um, it's nice to kind of go full circle and, you know, start off as a, a co-founding board member of a co-op and um, now um, work to help start up other co-ops. Um, and it's breaking up into two slides, which is, it's okay. Um, so this is, this is an overview. We're gonna kind of go over the fundamental building blocks this is not a technical overview. Um, so we're not gonna spend too much time looking at feasibility studies and how to write a business plan, um, right? We're gonna kind of look at the big picture questions of what it means to be a co-op. I want this webinar to be as interactive as um, possible. So feel free to kind of interrupt me as we go with questions um, or write down your questions in the, in the chat box and I'll kind of keep my eye out for that as well. All right, so let's start off with some quick co-op 101. Uh, um, so a co-op is at its core a democratically run organization, right? So that means one member, one vote. Um, a co-op is also a business. However, it is a business with a mission and purpose. So it's similar to nonprofits, but co-ops are in many cases uh, for-profit businesses. Um, within the cooperative framework, there are different types of cooperative models. These are just three of the most common types, and they have three main things in common. So first, they all aggregate economic power. They all access resources they couldn't access as lone individuals, and they're all democratic and owned by their members, right? So although they share these core commonalities, they are organized quite differently. So with the first example, a consumer cooperative, um, these are people that are buying together. And when most people think of co-ops, they're thinking of uh, food co-ops, which is probably the most popular example of a consumer cooperative. Sometimes when I tell people I work at a co-op development center, um, they think I work at the local food co-op because that's all people really know about. They don't know that there's all these different types of co-op models. Uh, there are also other types of consumer cooperatives out there. REI is uh, another popular example, um, started off here in Seattle. But there's also credit unions, right? Um, there are rural electric co-ops, um, brewery co-ops, um, housing co-ops. Like I said, I work with about five different mobile home parks that's structured as a co-op. And what all these, um, in each of these cases, people are consuming something. So with credit unions, 
you're consuming financial services, right? With rural electric co-ops, it's electricity. Um, with brewery co-ops, in this specific example, it's, it's beer. Um, and then housing co-ops um, would be affordable housing, right? So what they all have, and like the common thread is that the people that own the co-op are the same people that are consuming the goods and services, right? Um, some cooperatives sell together, such as producer cooperatives. Um, some examples include Organic Valley, um, where I live here in Seattle, we have a, a grower's market. Um, agriculture cooperatives are probably the most common type within this sector, right? So these are like farmers that by themselves don't have enough acreage or infrastructure to access these bigger markets or compete. But by joining with other farmers, they can achieve that economy of scale by sharing things like marketing services. Um, and it's also important to note that you can become a hybrid of a producer co-op as well, you know. Um, and then there's worker co-ops, which is gonna be the focus of this presentation. Although the vast majority of what we're gonna be talking about can apply to any of these other models as well. Um, some other types of co-ops are probably here is shared services co-ops. Um, a good example of that would be like an Ace Hardware. So each individual business is an owner of the co-op. Um, similar to producers cooperatives, they're kind of forming together to share things like branding and marketing and, and um, a lot of the overhead that goes, that's involved with running a hardware store business. Um, and there's also platform co-ops. These are often centered around web or mobile apps. So kind of leveraging technology and sharing it amongst other co-ops um, to kind of eliminate that barrier, which can be really expensive if you're trying to develop your own software for a specific um, reason. Um, we find that people um, kind of have somewhat different goals when starting up a cooperative, goals that are often not the priority of a traditional business. So we're gonna take a, a look at some of these here. Uh, good work, and this is a really, uh, this is a really important one. So having meaningful work for me is as good work um, there's an excellent episode um, from The Hidden Brain by Sean Carvedantum um, called You 2.0 Dream Jobs. And he talks about how having real ownership of the work that you do is incredible and it keeps you going, right? Um, keeps you motivated, keeps you from burning out. Autonomy and trust is also another important added value in the workplace and can give more meaning to the work that you do. So good work um, in this sense is a reason why people um, want to start co-ops. Um, also, fair pay. Um, this is one of the main tenets of a worker cooperative. So instead of your profits going to shareholders, they are being distributed amongst the people that work there, right? So fair pay means the money goes to the people who are most active. There's different ways to structure um, this, this um, um, patronage and um, wages. Uh, job security is another reason, although I have mixed feelings about this category because uh, like any other business, uh, co-ops can face the same pressures. However, you won't ever have to worry about maximizing profits to benefit shareholders. So um, co-ops will naturally prioritize job security when things get hard. Um, so you're sharing profits, but you're also sharing risk. Um, and community, and this, is, this is a big one. Um, co-ops are a community with of themselves. Um, the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops is a community of co-ops across the states. Um, and then co-ops are often involved in their local communities as well. So co-ops are kind of a triple bottom line business, right? Profit is important, um, but there's also environmental components and a social and community component to it as well. And so this is a map kind of that we keep track of um, at the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops. Uh, this is, you know, this is our best guess at, at doing some tracking of co-ops. What you'll see here is definitely a trend of like West Coast, East Coast, right? But that is kind of slowly changing. We're seeing a lot more interest and movement um, in the South, in the Southwest. Um, and so um, we're getting a lot more traction. It means co-ops are no longer becoming like this fringe economic model 
Um, we're seeing uh, people of all kinds um, wanting to start up co-ops for the reasons um, we mentioned. So co-ops are becoming more mainstream, which is a good thing. So what is it like to start up a co-op? So we're gonna kind of focus on these three main areas. So co-op capacity development. This is basically the culture and framework. How do you make decisions? How do you align? And how do you keep people involved? Um, we're also talking about business development. How do you make money to keep the business operating with the vision that you have? And this is often the area where cooperatives um, need the most help. And then there's also ecosystem development, which we're just gonna touch on lightly today. Um, but this is really about how do you communicate with the communities that share your vision? Where do you find your resources? Um, who are your key partners? Um, and how can we like do this uh, together? So in other words, how do I maintain the inside of the business, the business itself, and outside the business? And so a good metaphor to think about this is um, a startup is like a road trip. So first you have to get together with a group of people and figure out where you are going to go and how to cooperate, who's going to give directions, who's going to drive, who's going to be in charge of the music, right? So this is the co-op capacity development part. Work is being divided up and you're figuring out where you want to go together. And keyword uh, there is together. And now that you've gone together, you have a clear set of goals and responsibilities. The startup needs to make sure that they have a business or in this metaphor, a car that functions well enough to essentially get you to where you want to go, right? So running a business is a lot like tuning up a vehicle. Uh, we need to make sure that the business can function well enough um, to not only like pursue that vision that you have set forth, but also uh, make a profit. And lastly, you need to make sure that the environment around you is supportive or supporting enough uh, to help you on your journey. So let's, we'll start with um, co-op capacity. There are four areas that startup groups should spend some time thinking about. And a lot of times when co-op development centers are looking to see if they're able to work with a project, they wanna see that you've kind of done a bit of this first. Um, so what is your team's shared vision? Um, do you know who is a member and who is not? How do we delegate work? And how can we hold each other accountable? Um, so we'll need to move past the lone genius idea. Um, a, cooper a cooperative is a group of people. It can be as little as two people in some states, but it cannot just be one person. Um, this doesn't mean that a person can't bring a good idea to the group, but a shared vision still needs to be found. Um, if you're having trouble finding uh, people, I might recommend creating a meetup group uh, at meetups.com or posting on idealist.org, whatever it takes to find other um, like-minded um, people. And this is often one of the hardest parts for co-ops. Um, I often get calls and people are really interested. They have this really great idea, but it's just one person, right? Um, and we kind of have to remind them, well, hey, this is it's a group of people, right? Um, so once you have a group, you should then form a learning group. Um, at this point, you should work on your shared vision and what are your goals and what do you value? One, one second, um, my little boy just woke up. I'm gonna move outside. Okay. Everybody with me here so far? Yep, and there is a question for you in the chat, Daniel. Okay. How difficult is it to transition from a sole proprietor uh, to a co-op down the line? It depends on how far down the line, and it depends on uh, the type of conversion. So it's a great question. I think we're gonna have a, another workshop specifically on conversions, but I'll quickly mention that it's a lot easier to do the transition if, you, if you're if you like just started up the business, right? It also depends on if the owner of the sole proprietorship is selling to the employees and leaving or if they're becoming a part of the co-op. Um, so there are really two different types. Um, if they are selling and leaving, um, it could, um, it involves kind of usually doing an evaluation, a purchase and sales agreement um, so it can be difficult. It really just depends on the business. So 
So after you have your learning group, you're going to want to meet regularly. And so in the beginning, you should be meeting up a lot uh, for a startup. I would shoot for weekly meetings if you can um, and always create an agenda. This will keep your meetings focused and on track. Um, it also provides a history of what you are working on, right? Um, and this is not a bad time to practice creating meeting minutes either. Uh, so agendas are really important uh, to make sure that you have productive meetings. I mean, again, it provides history of what you're working on. This is a really simple agenda tool that I often use with co-ops. Um, it's called Agile Coffee Agenda. I'm not sure where that name came from, but you essentially use post-its. All the post-its live initially in the to discuss column. Each post-it is an agenda item. And then only one item at a time moves, moves to discussing, right? So we make sure not to get off tangent. Um, and this is a good visual way to kind of guide you through an agenda, even if you're using a printed out one. Um, and then um, action and vote. So this is really clarifying, hey, we don't want to just discuss things. Um, we also want to make sure that um, decisions are being made. Next, you're going to need to start thinking about what it means to be a member. So clarifying what it means to be a member. You're going to want to set up um, expectations around membership um, pretty early on, um, even if it's just some basic idea. So the situation you don't want to get into is one in which there are different opinions about who is a member and who is not. So imagine um, someone who rarely attends meetings and then shows up when an important decision is going to be made. Does that person have a vote? Well, if you resent their lack of regular participation, you might say no, um, but they might disagree. So if you have no standards set in place, you're gonna leave yourself open to some potential conflict. And then in the long run, these basic criteria for what is a, who is a member and who is not, you're gonna put these into your bylaws. There's a specific section around um, member eligibility um, that includes rights and responsibilities. And so you can start off small um, with um, like attending 60% of the meetings, right? Or not missing more than five meetings in a row or um, having pledged a hundred dollars uh, to the co-op, right? Um, sometimes it's money, sometimes it's based on participation. Um, whatever it is, you just make sure that it's written down somewhere um, and, and make sure that you refer to that. Um, and so just again, clarifying what it means to be a member um, some people are going to be on the fence. One in 10 meetings, um, they're not ready to become a member, but they're interested. I'm not ready yet to make the decision. That's, that could be fine, right? Um, but those people don't have um, a vote when important decisions are going to be made. They can have an opinion, but again, um, co-ops are made up of members, and each member has one vote. The other part of cooperative capacity is learning to delegate work. Um, the scenario to avoid here is the noble workaholic, where one person takes on a very large portion of the work, either out of enthusiasm, spare time, or capacity. And this seems good to kind of everyone at first, but it can create some interpersonal resentment, confusion over ownership and, the, and authority in the long run. I've personally seen board members who will initially kind of take everything on and are happy to. Um, but over time, they start to resent others for their non-participation, even though they kind of helped create that culture, culture early on. So the, the takeaway here is to find tasks for everyone to do, right? Find something meaningful for everyone to contribute. Some may still do more than others, and that's okay. Um, but leveraging the contributions of the whole group both increases what can be done and gives people practice of how to work within a group and make decisions, right? Um, you're also going to want to expect the unfamiliar. Um, so one reason people might not participate or take on work is because they're like, I've never done this before, right? Um, and that's going to be common across the startup process. There's going to be a tons of things that you've never done before. So we all just kind of have to commit to some self-learning and research um, and ask for help um, and know that we're kind of on this together, right? And so I learned a ton when starting up um, a, a co-op so it was it was a it was a good process um, and um, you just want to kind of leverage um, other folks in the group and we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, practicing accountability and this kind of goes with the delegation of work right 
Um, volunteer groups sometimes feel obligated to make every meeting feel good with the idea that it keeps people coming back. So when someone doesn't do what they promise, it's tempted to just kind of avoid it or beat around the bush, not really address it, right? However, this leads to poor accountability and will slow or halt the startup. Um, so some basic ideas around accountability are for every task that the group says it's needed, uh, put someone's name and deadline on it, right? And in every meeting, you check in on those tasks that are due. And if somebody's running late, right, um, you don't just beat around the bush. You just take time to ask why and ask if, you know, they need some help, right? Um, this is a great way of saying if you're not able to do this, just you need to tell us, you know, that's, that's fine. Um, but let's make sure that um, somebody takes on this task and that there's accountability. So again, uh, with the same idea with membership criteria, it pays to set the standard up early on. Um, and this is not about punishing people. It's about working together and pursuing the common goals. Um, and so there are a couple different ways to do this. Again, you know, you can do a really low tech way. I created a big poster that I laminated essentially was three columns for one of the mobile home co-ops I worked with um, where it had name, um, a task and a due date, right? That's like the simplest version of task tracking tool. Um, a little bit of a mid tech way is to use Google Sheets. And this is probably actually a little bit more important now um, with social distancing and remote work, um, Google Sheets already has task tracking tools you can use. Um, um, and so it's basically a spreadsheet um, that you can see in real time, everybody can access. Um, and the important thing here with task tracking systems is that not only can you see what you're supposed to do, you see what everyone else is doing as well. Um, so the fact that um, you know that everybody else has insight on the tax set you have leads to some self accountability. Um, Trello and Asana, I put these here as well, a little bit higher tech tools. Um, these are great um, task tracking tools as well. Um, if you have some people that are tech savvy, Asana takes, it's a little bit of project management, not just task tracking. Um, it's a great tool. We use it at the US Federation of Worker Co-ops. Um, and so all these are free. Asana is free for up to 15 people. Uh, Trello is free for an unlimited amount of people, but they have some paid features you can have as well. Um, and so, again, we want to practice accountability. And so we're going to create a system, um, whether it's Google Sheets, Trello, Asana. I mean, there's a ton of other ones as well um, and to make sure that we're tracking, tracking that. Uh, mobile home co-ops, do they own the land? I would think they would be not for profit, um, but for surviving, keeping and maintaining property and how to decide people to do. That is correct. They're a consumer co-op. So, and that's a good point you bring up. So worker co-ops are mostly for profit. Uh, consumer co-ops, on the other hand, I mean, they still, you still wanna make more money, um, right? Than you're um, expending, right? So say for, a rainy day or to grow um, as with like a food co-op, um, but they are not in the same way as for profit, right? And with mobile home co-ops, um, their, their, their revenue that they get is their own money that they're paying monthly on that lot, right? Um, in this mobile home cooperatives case, they actually, they do own the land. Um, and so before it was investor owned, we helped them organize. We got them, we worked with a nonprofit bank called Rock USA that lends money specifically uh, for this. So they got a huge, in many cases, it's a multi million dollar loan with zero down, um, pretty, really good interest rates, um, and without having to do any credit or background checks. Um, and um, so now they own that land um, collectively together. They own their individual homes. And so you're right, and in this case, they don't want to raise their rents. Um, they just want to keep things at cost. Um, they raise rents more than their expenses, right? For rainy days, uh, for capital improvements. Um, but you're right that um, it's, it's not a for-profit. And in Washington state, um, we actually have a specific nonprofit clause um, that we use for these mobile home parks. Um, it's not a 501c3 status, um, but um, it is a, 
a nonprofit status that we use for other co-ops as well. Um, but not all states have this uh, specific cooperative statute. And people decide their dues, their monthly dues, it's based on um, their expenses, right? And so we help work out a financial kind of plan. We every year do an annual budget. So we know how what their expenses are um, and how much they should be saving. So their dues are, are based off of or that, their monthly dues. Um, and then if they need to change their rent, which rent's not a really great word for them because they, they actually own um, their land, but if they need to change their monthly amount, um, they vote on that as members. So the next phase is business development. So how do we create value for customers? What is the right legal form? Um, how do we raise startup capital and what should management look like? So this first slide over here to the left is really about your value proposition. Who are going to be our target customers? Uh, who do we, who are we trying to solve a key problem for? And what is our product or service that we're offering? Um, and this is known as the value proposition. Um, this is a, a, a section that co-ops also really needs um, some help with. A lot of times you'll see a lot of people that are really knowledgeable about co-ops, the values, what they can do for the community. Uh, but fortunately that's not enough. It's also a business, right? And like any other business, you need to understand what value or niche you're providing. And at the end of the day, you're going to need a business that generates enough income to cover your expenses and uh, save for the future. So a tool to think about this is the value proposition. Um, there's a great book that I use on this and we do a webinar. It's called the business, it's called business model generation. Um, and it talks about the business model canvas. I'm not sure if anyone, if any of you have heard of this, but it's basically a visual mapping tool um, that helps you kind of figure out nine key building blocks to starting up your business. Um, one of them is like your revenue streams, cost structure, um, value proposition. Um, and it's a great tool to kind of, kind of build a business plan on one page. Um, it's something that I recommend that a lot of uh, co-ops do in, in the kind of the brainstorming phase. What's it called again? It's called Business Model Generation. Um, it's by Alexander Alsterwalder, who is a Swiss business theorist. Um, and he has another book called uh, Value Proposition Design. The book is well laid out, great formatting, really easy to read. Um, also, you can find... Um, a lot of the resources available for free online. Uh, Strategizer.com is a website that um, made this an online tool. Um, it costs money, but it is like a you have 30 day free trial. And so that's usually enough to kind of figure out, use the tool, and then you can export it as a, as a PowerPoint um, and, and keep it. Um, a lot of times when I'm working with co-ops doing a workshop, I go back to post-it notes. Post-it notes are great. Um, we just do this out on the whiteboard. Um, post-it notes are, are good because you can color code them and then see how the different building blocks are kind of interacting with each other. But again, it's a great tool. Um, although it doesn't specifically call out co-ops and um, Silicon Valley has definitely adopted this and has used this to their advantage. This can apply to any type of business, especially nonprofits and co-ops. Um, so what you can do to kind of tweak it for co-ops is when it comes to value proposition, what's the value proposition for your customers that are using your products or services, right? But then what's also the value proposition for your members, right? So a great tool. Um, creating a legal entity uh, is another big thing. And there's many ways to go about this. Um, and one of the things that depending on where you are, um, you might need to create an LLC if your state has cooperative statutes, um, then you can actually incorporate as a co-op and that's, and that's great. Um, even if your state doesn't have cooperative statutes, um, you could still incorporate in another state that does. There are some tax uh, reasons and benefits uh, for um, doing the co-op route as opposed to LLC. There also can be some great uh, reasons to do an LLC, even if your state does have cooperative statutes, especially if you guys 
are working with a group of anybody that makes um, kind of work status, um, this is a good way to kind of provide a, a buffer of anonymity uh, for owners. Um, and so um, this is this can be a good route to go for, for that. Um, feel free to message me about that more offline if um, you wanna learn more about that. Um, but basically, um, incorporation is a big part of your legal entity, right? Um, and bylaws as well. Um, I won't spend too much time on this, but um, those are your the two biggest um, founding documents for your co-op. That's what makes you a co-op. Um, a lot of times when we're working with co-ops that are on a shoestring budget, um, at the US Federation, at the Co-op Clinic, we're specifically just focusing on these two things, um, incorporation and bylaws. And the reason, I mean, bylaws encompasses everything. It's like the, it's the rules of your corporation, right? Um, so that's where you're gonna find out your purpose. Uh, your purpose is gonna be spelled out there. Um, membership eligibility, how many meetings you're having a month, um, voting rights, um, what's a quorum, um, all of that is spelled out. What's the cost to join? How is profit gonna be divided? Is spelled out into your bylaws. Or if you're an LLC, it's called an operating agreement. So often what we'll do is we'll help draft these bylaws or operating agreements, um, depending on how complex they are, we often will get them reviewed by an attorney as well. Daniel, I just want to uh, just jump in uh, really quickly because we have a, a bunch of people from our Anchor Institution outreach team uh, mm -hmm. joining. Um, so, uh, and, and they were expecting to start at 715. So I'm, I'm wondering, could we maybe do five more minutes just because I know we're going we're gonna to have a few more of these. I think it's fine. Um, yeah, yeah. That's, um. Well, so here's what we can do. I can take I can take five more minutes as questions. Uh, people think they have some burning questions they want to ask right now, rather than uh, kind of flying through the presentation. Yeah. So maybe we can just consider this as a natural um, uh, break point because uh, I know there were there were three large chunks: the capacity, the business development, and then the ecosystem. So maybe uh, we can say we'll continue uh, business development next time. Sounds good. Yeah, okay. are there any um, kind of burning I think questions? You're still sharing your screen, Daniel. Okay, fix that. There we go. Hi, this is Siona. I just wanted to say this is great. I think I, I'm really interested in hearing more in the upcoming weeks about the, um, the co-ops that you've experienced. Yeah. Um, or you've worked with, that you've collaborated with, that you've helped, um, and, you know, the different sectors. Um, so just to get more exposure. <laughs> um, oh, but yeah, thank you. Yeah, pretty much any business uh, can be structured as a co-op. Um, we've worked with an engineering co-op, um, construction, um, there's home care. Yeah. Um, any business out there you can structure using um, this model. Yeah, Ace Hardware was a little surprise to me. So yeah. it's effectively a franchise. It is. It's yeah. on the co-op kind of spectrum. It's yeah. you know, worker co-ops is way over there because there's a you know, there's a lot of rights. The people that work in the actual store are not the owners, it's just the actual owner of the store. Right. Cool. <laughs> And thank you for your uh, flexibility here, uh, Daniel. No problem. So just a com comment in the chat from Lady who said, very helpful. I've seen startups use business model generation canvas successfully. Uh, and Louise, I think, was just affirming, I think. OK, uh, so just saying this is a very informative series. I think that that was the affirmation there from Louise. Yeah, with the business model canvas, I've seen when these are done like correctly, these I've seen these be way better than the actual 15 page business plan. Um, and sometimes when you try to fit everything down and be con as concise as possible on one page, um, you kind of think about it in a little bit uh, on a different light. Um, so it's really helpful. Hey, hey Daniel, 
Oh, can Go I ask ahead. a question? Yep. Yeah, so um, in your presentation, you sort of alluded to like declare like what's a member like right off the bat while even deciding what the business model canvas would look like, you know, and who your customers are. And that's interesting because it seems like, do you expect that to like evolve over time? So then if those folks stay involved in the co-op, say for like two years after development, um, it, it, it can change membership in terms of, or like build from there. Is that why you suggest that at the beginning? Yeah, and it kind of does differ a little bit. So if we're talking about consumer co-op, um, it's, it's actually a little bit easier. A lot of people in consumer co-ops are not involved in a lot of decisions, yeah. but it's especially important with our worker co-op. And membership our criteria can change over time. And so mm -hmm. that could be amended in the bylaws. Um, so say you move through with that initial criteria that you already put and you put it into your bylaws, um, that could still even be kind of changing and evolve over time. Thanks. And Daniel, can I ask, I think there's a, there's a changing rule of thumb about um, like what is the bare minimum number of members to have before you approach funding, before you approach um, expansion possibilities. So I'm wondering um, what is your general rule of thumb in terms of how many people you need to have to be considered as a strong cooperative in terms of membership size and volume? Mm -hmm. So consumer co-op, that would definitely, you're gonna want like a, a large number there. Um, I think for food co-ops, they have like a specific amount. And that's really important when you're trying to apply for a loan because that equity that you're getting from consumers, say it's $100 each, even if it adds up to $10,000, you can still show a bank like, not only do we have this small amount of money, but this actually shows that people really want um, what we're wanting to start up. For other examples, I mean, you know, there's like if a tech co-op, you can easily start with two people. There's a lot of small businesses where you can easily start your co-op um, as two people. That is actually pretty quite common. Um, I see a lot of co-ops start off that are just like two to five. It really depends on your business model. Um, and for worker co-ops specifically, they tend to be um, a small amount of people starting up. Thank you. And then is it true that for food co-ops is, is generally about 500 people? Is that still kind of like the running I, number? I think so. The, um, that, that sounds right. Yeah, it's, it's, in, the, it's in the hundreds. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And then um, I'll just read one last comment in the chat before we uh, end this evening and, and move into breakouts. MJ said we have a co-op plaza in Porter Square in Cambridge. Uh, so just wanted to, to point that out uh, in the in the chat. Um, so to touch uh, our topic next, continuing uh, basic, um, I understand next Wednesday. Is that the plan? That is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ex Okay, I, uh, James Thomas continues. And I got a, a private chat from um, Matt uh, Feinstein, who's going to be doing the workshop next week. So Matt knows uh, where we left off here, and we'll be able to pick up uh, our conversation next week. So uh, very much looking forward to that. Um, Did we lose you? Lost. Nia? Nia, um, Nia kind of just dropped out for a minute um, and she will be back in like a second. <laughs> but we're working to separate you guys into breakout yeah. rooms for the next part. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jenny. And I'm back. So I'm going to stop the recording. Okay. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Yep. All right. Excellent. All right. Um, so I'll just take one minute for anybody who wants to leave. We, we just want to try to formalize this a little more so people don't feel bad. Uh, go ahead and leave now if you're not going to join us for our member teams. Walk out it the door. It was great to see you. <laughs>